I'll begin today with a story from 2010, as I have um, in, in, in other sermons as well, um, various stories from my ministry and my time. Um, I lived in Seattle and served as the Minister of Faith Formation and Social Justice at a congregation in the city's university district. Like other stories I have shared with y'all during this time, this, one's be this one begins on a plane, uh, because flying while clergy uh, and flying while a clergy woman can be a really interesting experience if you decide to tell the truth about what you do. So, oh, I felt my body relax as I settled into my seat on a red-eye flight from Seattle to Boston. It was a bulkhead seat, which I was really excited about, right against the window, and there was plenty of leg room, and I had both armrests to myself, and it was just going to be a good flight. I could feel it. Before I'd even set foot on the plane, I had done what a lot of introverts do. I had put my headphones in my ears to ensure that even though I wasn't actually listening to anything, uh, no one would talk to me and try to start some conversation. Um, I love people, but being held hostage on a plane for about six hours in the middle of the night is a little bit like my worst nightmare. And so on red-eye flights, I really like to prepare. I had my headphones in my ears, I was in this comfortable seat, and I began to situate myself for the long overnight flight across the country, hoping to fall asleep soon and wake up as the plane touched down hours later on the other's coast. Things were looking really good. It was going to be a relaxing flight. Suddenly, however, there was a tapping on my shoulder. Even with the headphones in and eyes assertively directed forward, only forward on a plane, that's my rule, the gentleman in the aisle seat was attempting to get my attention. I was hoping it was an accident, and so I pretended to drift off to sleep. But no, no, he kept tapping. And so with a bit of hesitation, I took my headphones out of my ears, I put my book down, and I turned to him. I mustered up all my extroverted energy, and I prepared myself for conversation. He looked warm and kind and nice. I can do this, I told myself. I can do this. Hello, he said. My name's Jerome, and I'm a salesman, and since we're stuck on this plane together for the next six hours, I thought we might get to know each other. <laughs> What's your name, and what do you do? Despite my initial reservation to enter into conversation during the flight, I felt excited. You see, back then I was a brand new minister, fresh out of divinity school at Vanderbilt and serving my first church in Seattle. I was still in awe of the fact that I was actually pastoring, called by a congregation. And so when Jerome asked me what I did, my pulse quickened and pride welled up within me as I responded. My name is Jamie Lynn, and I'm a minister at a church. Oh, like a children's pastor? asked Jerome. No, I replied. I'm an associate pastor. I work with children, but I also work with adults. But they don't, like, let you teach adults, do they? They don't preach, you don't, like, preach or teach men, right? Jerome inquired. When I told Jerome that I did indeed teach adults and that I regularly preached on Sundays to a congregation of men and women and non-binary folks, he immediately got out his Bible. So things were going really well at this point. I don't know if you can tell. Well, you're just wrong, he said. Your church and the people who called you are just wrong. Scripture is very clear. Women cannot be ministers. Jerome proceeded to quote every scripture he could think of that seemed to speak against women serving the church, flipping quickly through the pages of his Bible. 1 Timothy 2.12, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. Ephesians 5.22, wives submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. And his list went on and on. In that moment, I didn't have the heart to tell them that it, at that time I actually had a wife, uh, not a husband, and so... That would have been complicated as well. Um, but finally, he settled on what he called his favorite scripture about women. And he opened up his Bible to the, our lectionary text today, the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, specifically focusing on verses 30 and 31 of our Gospel reading. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. 
And they told Jesus about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. You see, Jerome said, she began to serve them, he continued. This is God and Jesus calling women to serve the men around them and to serve the church through the teaching of other women and children, through preparing food and helping the men with what they need so that they, the men, can be leaders. She served the men. I don't mean to offend you, Jamie Lynn, Jerome said, but God does not want you to be a minister. Now, I was not surprised that Jerome felt this way. There are several Christian traditions that do not believe that women and women-identified folks should be pastors. Thankfully not the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, in which I'm ordained, or a very closely aligned denomination, the United Church of Christ, um, of which y'all are a part. These other traditions think that women should teach children, women should cook, women should submit to their husbands and to the men around them. Clearly, Jerome asserted that night on the plane, and many continue to actually assert today, though it is easy to forget here in this place. Clearly, women cannot be clergy. In this morning's gospel text, the author of the Gospel of Mark outlines some of the earliest moments in Jesus' ministry. This is only his second healing miracle. A few of his newly called disciples, Simon and Andrew, tell Jesus that Simon's mother-in-law is sick. Jesus goes to their home where Simon's mother-in-law is lying in bed. He touches her, and as Jerome, Jerome pointed out all those years ago on that red-eye flight, she does indeed begin to serve them. She begins to serve them. Now, as many of y'all might know, the majority of the New Testament was first written in Greek. Our English versions of the scripture are translations of the original Greek text, and so when interpreting scripture, it is often important to return to its original language. The word translated as serve here in Mark chapter 1, verse 31, comes from the Greek word diakono. This word makes many appearances in the New Testament. When Jesus is tempted in the wilderness by Satan before his ministry begins and the angels come down to take care of him, the angels offer Jesus diakonio, translated in Matthew 4.11 as they cared for him. When Matthew describes Jesus in chapter 20, verse 28, he writes, Just as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life for many. Matthew uses the same Greek word here to describe the ministry and work of our Savior. When describing deacons in the biblical text, those who do the work of the church, who lead and teach and support and guide, people of all genders, by the way, again, this Greek word appears. In Romans, when speaking of his own ministry, Paul writes, but for now, I am going to Jerusalem in service to the saints. Again, the word used here stems from the Greek word diakono. Angels, Jesus, Paul, celestial beings, the Messiah, all of them are described as engaging in service, in diakono. A better translation of the word translated as serve here in Mark chapter 1, she got up and began to serve them, might actually be she got up and began to minister to them, to care for them in offering spiritual support. She got up to do the work of the church. She got up to do the work of the church. Jesus healed Simon's mother-in-law, and she immediately got up and began to minister. Here in this text, before anyone else knows that Jesus is the Messiah, before a single one of Jesus' disciples understands who he is, before another human being gets up and does the work of the church, Simon's mother-in-law is the first. She is the first deacon and the first woman to serve as a minister to Jesus and those gathered in Simon's home, but she is not the last. Women have engaged in ministry, have served the church from the birth of Christianity until this very moment. Martha, whom we meet in the Gospel of John, was one of Jesus' closest friends and disciples. Mary Magdalene is one of the first witnesses of the Gospel, proclaiming, I have seen the Lord. It is women who were with Jesus at the crucifixion, and it is women who are the first to see the empty tomb. 
Tabitha, a widow, meets us in Acts, and we are told that she financially supports a large portion of the early church. Junia is referred to as an apostle, and Phoebe a deacon. Priscilla, Chloe, Lydia, and Nympha, we hear of these women and encounter their stories in the biblical text if we open our ears and our eyes to their presence in the pages of the New Testament. Like Jerome, there on that red-eye flight, we can certainly interpret the text to communicate that women cannot be pastors. But it is an equally valid, equally academically respectable, equally faithful interpretation to look at the original Greek and look at the women of the New Testament and to affirm with a resounding yes their ministry and their qualifications to serve as pastors, as ministers, as clergy. On the day of my ordination to the ministry in July of 2010, I got down on my knees and I felt the weight of our conference minister's hands on my shoulders. And then I felt the weight of all the other ordained clergy as they too came forward and placed their hands on my head and neck, shoulders and back. And then the elders, the board, the deacons of University Christian Church came forward and they too laid hands on me. And finally, the entire congregation joined me there on my knees at the front of the sanctuary in the middle of my ordination service and they said yes. Yes, Jamie Lynn, we affirm you, we see you and we acknowledge your call. Much like this moment of my ordination to the ministry, Jesus' call to Simon's mother-in-law does not happen in a vacuum or in isolation. The house is full of people who Jesus, when Jesus heals her, calls her, and she rises and begins to minister to them. This is what the church looked like in the earliest days of Jesus' ministry and the earliest days of Christianity. Churches were house churches, small groups of people gathered in homes, witnessing to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. I was called and supported in my ministry by a community. And Jesus calls and supports the ministry of Simon's mother-in-law amidst a house full of people, amidst a crowd of followers who would one day call themselves the church, call themselves Christian. And while it may be tempting for us, First Congregational Christian United Church of Christ, to lean back in our pews here today and say, but this is old news, Jamie Lynn. We have had this whole women in leadership thing figured out for a long time, and it is, unfor it is unfortunately still relevant in our world today. It is unfortunately still relevant. Only 24 of the CEOs of all the Fortune 500 companies are women. In, a state, in the state of Virginia, women are paid 78 cents for every dollar a man makes. And in 2010, a multi-faith sample of 11,000 American congregations found that only 12% of all congregations in the United States had a female as their senior or sole ordained leader. Only 12%. These facts are startling, and the news is the same. If y'all will remember, in 2018, there was the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh, and stories continued to pour out from survivors of sexual assault. Me too, me too, me too. And so I would posit to y'all this morning that this is not old news, First Congregational Christian United Church of Christ. Supporting women in leadership is a real and active charge and a challenge for each of us here today, as much as it has ever been. I look at my eight-month-old daughter, I look at the incredible young women and women-identified folks here today, I listen to our news, and then I look at Simon's mother-in-law here in our scripture. And I think that one of the questions the lectionary is positing for us this morning is how will we continue, continue to support women and women-identified folks who serve and lead and preach and teach? How will we stand with those who say me too or attempt to share their stories? How will we, as a radical act of our faith and our beliefs, respond to any person or institution who seeks to demean women or deny their power, value, and fierce worth? Many years ago, I was silent when I sat on that plane with Jerome. But now I have the power and privilege of standing with so many incredible folks Folks like you, who use your voices and your sanctuary and your church to make statements of boldness and power. And so may you continue to be bold, may you continue to be faithful, and may we continue to follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. And now please receive this benediction. 
Everlasting God, you give strength to the powerless and power to the faint. You raise up the sick and cast out demons. Make us agents of healing and wholeness that your good news may be made known to the ends of your creation. Amen. <laughs> 